I've just released a brand new course called the Five Minute Music Producer. The Five Minute Music Producer gets you a new music making activity every single day for a whole year. You can join month by month or sign up for the whole year at once. If you've ever struggled with coming up with ideas, writer's block, remembering your ideas when it's time to make music, having inspiration, or just having clear workflows for making music, then this is the course for you. Each day you'll get a new activity that will help you write more music, make better lyrics, develop solid workflows, learn techniques for generating ideas, and giving you a process that you can rely on. Professional music producers can't wait for inspiration to strike when it's time to make music. They have to get to work all the time, so they have routines and workflows that they count on. This course will help you build those routines and workflows that will make sure that your inspiration is always at hand and you can make more music all the time. Each daily activity takes only about five minutes to do, so even when you're not feeling like making music, you can still probably commit to a couple minutes. And you'll be surprised how often that those couple minutes turn into a full session because you get inspired. Sometimes you gotta get the momentum going before things start happening. And the five minute music producer is designed to help you do just that. So if you wanna try it out, the first week is totally free. You'll get seven of these lessons that will help set you up with some cool workflows. And if you like it, stay aboard and enjoy the ride. You can sign up for the five minute music producer at brianfunk.com slash five minutes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. It's great to have you here today because on today's show, I have a repeat guest. I got Sean Giovanni, a.k.a. Gio, who's here. He is the owner and a producer and engineer at the record shop in Nashville. Uh, we spoke uh, probably about two years ago now, and uh, the world has been pretty crazy since then, so it's going to be nice to catch up. Um, it was great talking to Sean the first time. And I have a feeling it's going to be good again because he's got a good positive energy to himself. And if you are watching, you can see he's got a shirt on that says happiness. So I like that energy right off the bat, man. Good to see you again, Gio. Good to see you as well. Thanks for having me, man. Excited to chat with you again. Yeah, yeah, man. It's been, a, it's been an interesting two years, huh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's uh, yeah, been, been, been pretty wild. Yeah. But I understand you're doing pretty well with things. You're you're managing to uh, cope to this new normal that we're in. Yeah, yeah, totally. That uh, we've been really fortunate in Nashville and our you know community as a whole and in the recording industry to be able to stay pretty consistently rolling through things. You know, we really weren't as impacted as much as the touring you know industry mm -hmm. uh, might have been. Right. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. I guess people still need to make music, right? Still need to record. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there were some cool things that uh, that came out of this experience or that experience of the last couple of years as well. Uh, was thinking creatively about how to expand the ways that we can serve artists and help them share their art with their fan base. Hmm. And one of those was getting into live streaming uh, broadcasts, and oh, that nice. became a, a really substantial thing over the past couple of years. That has become a whole nother kind of d division of our production company. Hmm. Well, that's cool. So that's kind of filling in some of the gaps, I suppose, for like live performance for people. Um, yeah, it, well, it started that way um, when, you know, all the tours, all the shows were canceled. And then I think that what I started to see was the technology that was there to be able to host an event or a presentation or something like that remotely started getting utilized in different ways to be able to bring in an audience from different places that couldn't you know, mm -hmm. necessarily uh, be there. So we got into doing partnering with some organizations that host virtual events for uh, big organizations and corporate companies. Mm. And w uh, most of them that we've done, we've been the studio that's broadcasting the entertainment portion of those events. So they'll have speakers throughout the day and um, we just did an, an award show uh, for a medical company the other week, and uh, most of it was just them talking, and you know their 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 uh, executive you know board talking to the employees and um, and having some like guest speakers and that sort of thing, and then they'll come to the they'll tap into our line at the studio, and then the band will will perform for them and you know be the entertainment uh, portion of it, mm. uh, and then another thing the way that this live streaming technology has started to get utilized for content creation is that artists can now come into the studio and have a fully edited, you know, polished uh, performance video 
all in one shot, you know, mm -hmm. when, when we do it because we're set up for broadcast and switching multiple camera angles live and uh, have the crew and the, the lighting for it. Um, so that became a thing that where we have these like content shoot days where an artist will come in for an entire day uh, with a whole catalog of uh, either performance stuff and, and interviews and um, and then getting some photos and that sort of thing. And we're able to help them generate uh, a lot of promotional content around a release or around general social media strategy uh, in a in a really effective way that where they're they're able to kind of get it all a lot of stuff done in one shot. Mm. Oh, that's a great idea. So that you can offer like whole packages to groups or artists that uh, you know not just to record, but also to put out like all that extra material that all needs to be done upon a release. Yeah, and, and we've I've, we've always done that as a company. But what changed is that in the past two years, I started investing in all the equipment so we could do it all in house, mm -hmm. as opposed to always contracting out the you know the crews for it. Uh, and then being able to set up the studio with with all of the broadcast capability uh, was was a, definitely a big uh, transitional move that we made. Right, and yeah, the world of video and broadcast is a whole other dimension, right? Yeah, it's pretty wild. Uh, fortunately, I have I have <clears throat> excuse me. Fortunately, I have some great people on the video side that have been able to come in and help make uh, all the shows you know run well and uh, in that. And I think that's an important thing when branching out into a new area of business. Uh, if it's not something that you are an expert in yet, you know, make sure that you get some experts in there instead of uh, trying to, you know, kind of halfway, you know, be be okay at it. Uh, we really wanted to excel with doing that, and by getting a really great team around us you know, to be able to do that, it allowed us to take on some bigger projects and execute at a really high level, which has led to a lot of growth in the referrals and uh, you know additional work and stuff that we get through it. Hmm. Yeah, that's something I, I remember appreciating about what you do is that you tend to find like uh, other ways to you know succeed in this ever changing industry. You know, things are always evolving, especially in the last you know decade um, and and even the last few years. Um, you've found ways to just kind of pivot constantly because I think. Um, if if you're not doing that, it's easy to get kind of washed away in all the changes that are constantly happening. Yeah, I think it's important um, to do that, and I think it's also important to make sure that whatever those like pivots or adjustments are that you're making or expansions that someone's mm -hmm. making are still relevant to the core of what they're passionate about. Uh, I think that that especially you know th these days it's really easy to get caught up in having so many like different side hustles and stuff. And a lot of times people will just hear about something. Oh, you can make some money doing that. Well, I guess I'll try to, you know, to, to do that thing to, you know, to, um, you know, make some extra dough. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of multiple revenue streams is very important for, I think, for, uh, for someone in the in entertainment industry or that might have a freelance, you know, path or uh, trying to figure out a way to have a, a business like a recording studio survive in, you know, the modern music industry. Thinking creatively about all that stuff is great, is important. But I think it's also important to make sure that each of those things that you're expanding into are still connected to the core focus, uh, yeah. especially when you're creative, um, because we could it can can become easy to kind of get distracted with a bunch of you know different things and then never be able to execute at a really high level with any of them. So yeah. I've always tried to make sure that whatever new venture that I'm exploring or uh, is still focused in on my main goal of helping artists serve their artistic vision. Mm -hmm. And if it connects to that, and we're gonna be able to have a new resource that will help them do that, then I'm totally open to, you know, to get, in, get in into, into exploring a new potential opportunity. Um, but someone, I, I worked on a, a TV show uh, recently, a, a, a network uh, series. And it was just something that I kind of fell into because one of my production clients uh, was uh, became a host of this show and they needed someone to mix the first episode before like it just sort of they, it was a timing thing where they just needed somebody that understood audio you know that could do it and fortunately I had a bit of experience um, just kind of assisting people with that or having uh, smaller form things not necessarily uh, like network TV but um, you know uh, online content um, smaller like local broadcast you know kind of stuff and understood the basis of dealing with audio, you know, and video. Um, but someone asked me after I did that, they're like, well, is this like a new thing that you're gonna, 
um, that you're going to start offering at the studio and like and dive into. And um, that particular thing is is not necessarily for me because it's not connected to me serving an artist's vision. Mm. The TV broadcast like Lane is a totally, in my mindset, a totally different side of the industry. So we can do that stuff here at the studio if it has to do with music performances and that sort of thing. But I'm not going to add a page on my website to say that now I'm a TV mixing you know engineer because there are people that are experts at that that have dedicated their whole life to learning that. Uh, you know that craft mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, so I try to venture out into things that are still connected to like the core focus, and I think that's an important thing to mention when you're talking about the uh, you know desire to have a diverse business. I guess. I, I think that's a great idea and a great point because if you do suppose start offering that, right? Um, you could potentially, since you're not already at the point, it's not serving that common goal, but you might find yourself doing work that you're not really that into and it's not serving the purpose and could therefore kind of damage the, all the other stuff you're doing too. Um, if you're trying to, uh, if, if I, for instance, started going into science classrooms to teach as an English teacher, okay. I'm going to damage my credibility as a teacher in general. And it's going to take away from what I'm doing. I love that idea of having that kind of guiding principle because it, I think it is easy to get lost in opportunities because, I mean, that sounds really awesome. TV production, you're going to be mixing these like shows that are going out to millions of people. I could easily see the allure of that, but it's, again, not in line with your mission and could therefore lead you down paths you're not as interested in or not as willing to work for as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think that's like a great thing to keep in mind, not just on the large scale too, but on those like individual projects, even as like a music producer, to have some sort of what you're trying to do idea <laughs> before you just go and do. I find Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, it leads yeah, to a I lot think of like that, that was something sessions. that was helpful for me to be able to build the the brand and the in the vision for what the record shop became was focusing on working with artists that I could creatively connect with, Mm -hmm. which when you're first starting your career and you're just trying to figure out how to pay your rent every month, that's a challenging thing to be really selective with, you know, with artists you work with. So there's definitely a period of time early on in my career where if someone would pay me money to put a microphone in front of them, I said, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I found that as I started to build, you know, a client base and started to get a little more comfortable into Okay, I know this month, you know, the, these these last few months, um, it, it's been pretty easy to you know to pay my bills and you know and take care of things. Maybe there's some things that I could sort of cut out of my um, uh, workload now that aren't serving my purpose in the strongest way. They might be you know helping to create a little bit of security for me, but if I took out those things and I spent that time going and seeking out. Uh, more of the type of people that I want to be working with as opposed to the things that you're just doing to, you know, get another gig, uh, then I was, then over time, you know, you're able to work primarily, you know, with those things and then eventually exclusively on those things that, that you're really passionate about uh, working on. So I think you bring up a really strong point um, about being cautious of, you know, of opportunity. It's definitely great to say yes to everything when you're getting started because, you never kind of you, you don't know at first where your strongest skill sets are going to lie. Mm. Um, I know I didn't, and it was it was great for me to have all these different types of you know experiences early on, just by kind of being the freelancer that kind of take any gig that I could figure out how to uh, you know how to take on. Uh, but then and then after a few years of doing that, it made sense for me to start to focus down on these individual things that I had figured out that I was the most passionate about uh, and really enjoyed. And, you know, definitely a, a process to be able to get to that point, um, but something to keep in mind, I think, as you're, you're, you know, you're going through your creative exploration and deciding how you're going to spend your time. Mm. Yeah, because you, you're going to have to work hard one way or another. And in that, putting in those hours and that time, it, it could be very easy to burn out if you're kind of taking anyone that's willing to record and you're working with maybe music you're not that into or it doesn't do much for you. Um, 
uh, enough of those days in a row, you kind of start saying, oh, I don't want to go to work anymore. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that's a horrible feeling to have when, when you have the privilege to be able to find something that you truly love and that can become your work, you know, and then that work actually feels, if that work starts to feel like work, then, you know, what a, what a bummer that turns into. But early on, I had a, a practice or, a, I guess, a mindset that I would try to take with, with sessions that I, that I had like that, where I would focus on it as practice. And so I, w- I would, wouldn't focus as much on, am I being artistically fulfilled in this moment and get bummed out because I don't necessarily, like, love their music or maybe, you know, it's, they're they're not as you know have a ton of talent or you know or something and sure. these crazy gigs that you'll you know that you'll get on early on in your career, but I would focus instead on what skill set can I improve in this process. Maybe it's uh, you know a vocalist that is um, you know having trouble hitting the notes or getting the right tone or something. Well, in that scenario, I'm going to be able to learn how to communicate better, how to think creatively about how to give constructive criticism and guidance you know, to, uh, to someone, how to keep someone's spirits up if they're not necessarily, you know, getting that magic, you know, take right away. And so, so that allowed me that those opportunities, even though they weren't necessarily things that were creatively fulfilling, they gave me experience that Mm. prepared me to execute at a really high level. Once those very creatively fulfilling opportunities started to become more available to me. Mm. You know, that's a similar thing I think about when something comes up. And if I'm not sure about it necessarily, I, I ask myself, will there be something I learn from it? Is this going to add to a skill set or um, even even add to like a network type of thing or um, just getting to know people? If I can say yes to that, you know, where, you know, hey, I might not, this might not succeed, this might not be what I want to do, but I will learn something from it. It will add to you know what I'm able to do. Then you're right; that does help quite a lot as uh, getting the most out of it, and it's not a waste. It's how I started the podcast. Honestly, I was thinking about that. Like, will I learn from this? I'm like, well, at least I'll get to talk to some people. And I'll probably figure some stuff out with them. I don't know if I can even do that, but <laughs> it was. Um, it, it took some of the pressure off too uh, about doing it. But it, it gave it the secondary purpose where, um, yeah, I think that's a great thing to think about because um, in that way, you can really make almost anything you do in your life meaningful. Like uh, even mm-hmm. uh, cutting your grass is practice doing a good job at something. I'm going to make sure that grass looks great when I'm done. And right. that's just practice at um, putting in solid effort at things. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What do you look for in artists? Like, what is it for you that um, helps you click with them on that creative level? Uh, I get really excited when an artist ha- has a has a clear vision for what they want to accomplish, and that could be either the style of the of the music or the theme of the of the song or the group of songs that they might be working on, the message that they're trying to to get across, or just their general energy and passion for their craft. Mm-hmm. And if I that that's really a, the one of the first things, you know, that I, that that I look for is just why is this why are they going after this and is, is their vision something that I feel like I can align with, you know, and and support. Um I am not necessarily as inspired by the folks that have the mindset of um I'm just going to kind of try this out cuz it's fun and we're going to see what happens with it. I get really excited about uh, artists that uh, are already established and have that career and proven, you know, track record, or artists that are just getting started and this is who they are. Like you can just tell that they're, you know, they're an artist. They're not, mm-hmm. you know, anything else. There's not another option for them. Uh, if I'm if I'm thinking about new um, new projects that I would be working on on like a development side of things, uh, those are the the types of attributes that um, that really appeal to me. And then stylistically, um, I'm pretty diverse in the type of music that I'm that I get inspired by. I really am more about what is the message that they want to get across, and I'm not as like genre specific, you know, w- w- within that. Uh, I would say that I'm probably lean towards mainstream music in a top forty category within a variety of genres, between 
uh, pop and hip hop, R and B, gospel, country, and mm-hmm. rock. Um, but I, uh, I, I'm just I'm drawn towards purposeful music. When people ask me what kind of music I like, I, that, that's the term that I've I've started to use. Purposeful uh, because there's, uh, it's really not not genre specific, but there's a purpose behind it. And it feels like it can move me in some way. Um, mm-hmm. I uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm really into it. I really enjoy working on gospel music for that um, mm-hmm. for that reason. Uh, just the the energy that's around. We had a really great gospel session last night, uh, and I just I ended the day just feeling like elated and just in like a great mood because uh, mm. you know the the energy is just so uplifting and intentional about the the purpose of the music. Right, right, yeah. That's that's exactly what we're going for <laughs> for that uplift spiritual feeling. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool to hear because. Um, it kind of speaks to an open mind too, musically, that you're able to um, not just decide like, well, this is just our lane, because you could be in the exact lane you want to be and be around like, you know, just a drag to work on certain things if that that kind of feeling isn't there. I like that purposeful music. <laughs> it kind of helps you appreciate a lot of kinds of music when you think of it that way, like what is the purpose of it? Um, and, yeah, for sure. I, I've, I, I've, it's you know, some people love certain kinds of music and hate other kinds of music, and that's totally cool. Everybody has their own taste. But uh, my dad was a big influence on me around being open to different styles of of music, and so I, I don't really call, I, I wouldn't call any type of art bad. I might not understand it, I might not connect with it, um, but it's still art, and someone created it, and it, it inspired them, you know, in in some way. And I, I feel like as an as a artist, I have a responsibility to be respectful towards other people that are exploring their form of art. And I, I just feel like the, the criticism that could come with calling something like, you know, not authentic or not real music or, uh, you know, or that sort of thing is just a bit short-sighted in, mm-hmm. from an artistic standpoint. If someone's just a fan of music, you know, I mean, there's plenty of people that have very strong, strong opinions, you know, about that, but... If you're creative, I feel like it's it's so beneficial and helpful to be open to other people's perspectives of what art is, and um, just allows us to feel like as artists we're supposed to be, or we're not supposed to be, but are naturally as artists we're just naturally wired to explore new ideas and be you know be interested by new ways of thinking about things that are different from the masses, you know, mm-hmm. and that's what I think really sets apart impactful artists that have timeless careers Mm. so i just really i and and so i just enjoy it you know exploring the the different genres and i found that not it wasn't an intention necessarily but as music has evolved into become more consumed on a on a playlist type platform there's music that that the the line between genres has become pretty thin and I don't meet as many people these days that are like, I only listen to rock and roll or I only listen to rap music or something, you know? Uh, It seems like people coming up and kids are very versatile in the type of vibes that they listen to. And it's more about the mood uh, that they're, Mm -hmm. you know, that they're in. So they're looking for a playlist that's going to fit their mood or their environment or the activity that they're in, you know, that they're engaging in. And that's going to be the soundtrack for that. Um, rather than walking into the record store like we did when we were younger and you go right to, you know, that category of music that's all, you know, right there that's the, you know, that's what you listen to. But um, now we're consuming music in more of a playlist, you know, form where the genres are not necessarily defining in a lot of cases what the playlist is about. Mm. I found myself choosing playlists to listen to because of the purpose. It's like bedtime music or it's mm-hmm. like workout music or you know uplifting or you know the kind of like uh music that feels good to be depressed to, <laughs> you know. It's <laughs> not like rock pop. I wonder if that's because um when I'm thinking back to like when I'm younger and growing up, you know, and listening to music in like the 90s, um a lot of the types of music were still pretty young. I mean, even maybe like stuff like rock was getting older, but like when rap started coming out and more electronic music started coming out, EDM type of stuff, it was very like its own new thing. But over the time, it, 
in not too many years, really, you started seeing like rock and hip hop combining and then like pop and country combining. So like everything has had this chance now to kind of like intermingle. And I guess it might be, uh, we might be seeing that in the younger people now growing up with all these styles of music that are really like seven styles of music stuck together. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Then in that case, um, it becomes harder to identify yourself as like a rock and roller or like, you know, whatever you, you might want to say. And instead you're kind of going for like the mood, the, the, the feeling, the, uh, the, as you said, the purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Some of my, when, when I'm going for like deep dives into new music, I often look for stuff that's related to what I'm doing at the time whether I'm going right. for a run or something. I don't even care what comes on as long as it's going to get me psyched up. Yeah, I'm mm. the same way. Mm. You said something about like kind of doing like development stuff with artists. Um, so is that part of like what you guys do? Because I, I would assume that goes with the serve the artist vision um, kind of uh, theme you have. Yeah, when the record shop became an idea in my mind. It was pretty early on when I had moved to Nashville. I moved here for a job at a major studio. That opportunity fell through. Started working as a freelance engineer and producer, and I set up a little makeshift studio in an apartment that was on 16th Avenue on Music Row in downtown Nashville. And in that uh, process, I started going out every night, going to a writer's night, a you know, show, showcases, trying to meet artists, writers, just find an opportunity to, to collaborate and hopefully find some work, you know? Mm. And my, so my early days were working with artists that were brand new to town like me uh, because those were the only people that were willing to work with me. Uh, they didn't have a network yet. Uh, so they, they, you know, they, I might have been the first engineer that they met that moved to town and I said, hey, I got a little studio down the road, you know, do you want to come in and, you know, record a demo? And so through that process, it, I got right into the creative collaboration side of things. If I would have gotten a job at a traditional studio like I had planned on, I would have been a Pro Tools oper- an assistant, a Pro Tools operator, eventually a lead engineer, hopefully one day working your way up to, you know, to, to, to producing. But because I was started as a freelance person, my relationship with the artist was to handle all of those roles because they weren't at the level where they could Uh, afford or they had a producer that was bringing them into a commercial studio environment. So I was fortunate to be able to gain this experience to discover that my passion wasn't just about creating sound, but about serving an artist's vision and helping that vision come to life. And that's what I started to recognize that I got the most excited about in the, in the creative process was uh, meeting the artist, hearing their song or their, their general idea, and then helping that take that from just a basic form into something that's a tangible product that we can then share and you know get out and distribute. So when I found that that was the exciting thing, and then I started building this idea around the record shop as a you know as a business and as a way to be able to define my philosophy as a producer and engineer. The business model was always based around uh, project development. My, my goal was to you know graduate so I'd be working on projects that were already developed and, and that sort of thing. But I also enjoyed the, the, the relationship building and the long-term process of working with an artist that was you know, brand new, just starting the, in their career and helping guide them through that, helping them develop their sound. You know, it's kind of like a blank palette that we're able mm-hmm. to build from and that I'm able to um, imagine you know, a direction from with, uh, by seeing the vision that, they, that, the, that the artist has themselves. So I got really excited around that and that became the core of uh, of the record shop. I, I didn't intend to own a, a recording studio that just like books studio time and and records you know people or handles like just the technical side of things. It's always been about uh, project development and uh, and so and artist development is definitely a part of that uh, as well. Hmm. So you can look back now and see this as a good thing, right? Because um, it it taught you what you actually enjoy and what you want to do. But um, I believe you were you twenty years old when you moved to um, Nashville. To, to um, yeah, the I think I, I was nineteen or twenty. Nineteen or twenty. So you were certainly taking a bit of a leap of faith, I'm sure. 
anytime you leave home to go pursue a career in music or art or you know the circus or whatever people like decide to yeah. do, you know you're you're taking you, a chance. I think it. I think it. Uh, it's it's very reasonable to describe it that way, but I didn't feel like it was really a leap of faith. I felt like this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to figure out how to make it happen. I was pretty stubborn with that. And I, and I was very fortunate to be able to find this passion at a really young age. So by the time I got to that point where I was ready to go out on my own, I could do it with, with complete confidence. Doesn't mean that I, that I wasn't a little scared at times of how, you know, how am I gonna survive or that it wasn't uneasy. Uh, it was definitely super challenging. Um, but I didn't feel like it was a leap, leap of faith. I had a lot of confidence in, hmm. that I developed over the years of in, in middle school and high school in my parents' basement, recording my buddies, you know, bands and stuff and plugging cheap mics into a four track set recorder and, you know, <laughs> and figuring out how it works. So once I was ready to, you know, to be an adult and, you know, and start a career, uh, there was no question at, at all um, for me. So it, it didn't, I guess it may have been, but I think that it gets a lot easier to take those giant leaps when you find your purpose and what you're what you're ultimately the most passionate about and then you have the I, like I, I don't it's kind of a natural thing for me but just I had this feeling that there wasn't another thing when I was a kid I was either going to be a professional hockey player or I was going to work in the music industry and uh, I chose music when I when it came time to make the college decision and you know and that sort of thing right two pretty big dreams there <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank God for parents' basements, right? I, I yeah. did the same thing. I, I had kind of taken over the parents' basement and, uh, you know, slowly built some things up and just experimented on end down there, learning, figuring stuff out. And, and you know, really before all this was available on the internet to look up, it was, it was much harder to get that information. And it's funny, I was cleaning out the basement. Uh, my parents just recently moved, sold the place. So kind of said goodbye to the area. And I found like all these like <laughs> print printouts of like stuff I found about like how an EQ works, how a compressor works. And it just kind of made me chuckle because now you can just, you know, pull up a video. You don't need to have that little printout. And, right. But that was like valuable stuff when you came across it. Any of that wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. It's cool to hear you came from that as well. <laughs> yeah, those, those were fun days, man. Yeah. Uh, so I guess you you mentioned you, you did have the like um, expecting to work at the studio, but it just didn't work out. So um, it, I think it speaks to your determination that you, you've decided to find a way anyway, because I'm sure that would be enough to scare a lot of people off. But it's it's nice to know, and I think it's a good lesson for everybody that sometimes those weird detours that seem like setbacks or like major <laughs> failures or whatever happens to us, uh, sometimes it puts us on the course we need to be on. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I, when I moved here in that, in that for that job that, you know, that fell through, I was really devastated and definitely had those short lived feelings of like, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? Maybe I should move back home to Detroit and maybe try it there. I don't know anyone here. I don't understand the town yet. You know, I'm not part of the community, but I could probably find a friend, you know, back home that's connected to a studio somewhere and, you know, maybe work. But I just, I, I really wanted to be in this epicenter of songwriting and music production in a place that was the um, pr best one of the best you know areas and yeah. uh, organization or uh, markets and culture to be in for audio production and musicianship and songwriting you know so just sticking it out you know a, a little bit and then I I just sort of made this agreement with myself you know I'm gonna just gonna figure out how to make it happen mm -hmm. and I didn't know how that was necessarily gonna you know gonna work out but those experiences that were not exactly the path that I thought, um, you can, I can definitely look back now and see like, oh wow, like that was amazing that that, that happened because it led me into this other 
opportunity that there's no way that I could have, you know, envisioned that that would have been the path. I was pretty headset because that's all I've, all I had read and all I was told was that, you know, you get an internship, you, you know, kind of climb the ladder and then eventually you might go out on your own, you know, someday, but you got to get that initial experience in those environments. And, um, and I felt like I was, you know, missing out by not necessarily having that, uh, until, you know, you're a few years down the road and I'm able to look back and, and see how much freedom and like opportunity it provided for me to be able to find, um, that path. Uh, but I def definitely had to search for it in order to discover it. And it wasn't anything that I recognized in the moment other than I knew that this was going to be my career. Mm -hmm. One way or another. <laughs> yeah, cool. I, it's, it's good. I think when I look back on my life too, um, it, it, the path makes sense looking back. But, you know, while you're on it, you, you know, the you know, it's like you have no headlights on and you're just driving down the road. You got to trust, you'll get somewhere, I guess. And if you've got that kind of work ethic and that kind of passion, um, you know, that's the one thing you can control, right? Is like what you put into it, your determination. You can't necessarily control what happens. That studio shuts down or they don't have the position anymore. Or you name it. Um, there's a million potential factors, but showing up, keeping at it seems to be the trick. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, really the only things that we can control are our actions and our reactions to things, yeah. but we can't control other people. We can't control what, you know, what happens to us. We can't control the result of the actions that we take. We can only control what we choose to do and what we choose to think. And I've learned now I feel like an old man, <laughs> you know, starting to like really recognize these things, but I've found so much value in simplifying the process of or journey you know of your career and of life in general by recognizing how understanding the limited amount of control we have can give you so much freedom mm. because then then you know that you have the ability to choose and make that you know decision but when we're so focused on trying to figure out a way to be able to make something happen a specific way that that we want it um as opposed to just thinking about how can we react in a way that's going to be able to move us more positively, uh, you know, towards the uh, the outcome, you know, that we're that we're looking for, um, it sets us up to be able to have more power and control over our fulfillment. I think in life, at least for me, that's been my experience. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really important one, and I think I first came across that idea in might have been like I was doing like confirmation classes through the church and you know I was I was the kid that did not want to go I was especially that time I was just learning guitar and all I want to do is play my guitar and and I had to mm -hmm. do these classes you know to make my folks happy uh, but it was like I think they call it the serenity prayer where it's um you know um something along the lines I'm sure people know it uh grant me the wisdom to see what I can control what I can't control or give me the, I, I'd have to look it up right now, but it, it, what the thing I took away from it was, was like, there's things I can control and there's things I can't. And I, there's no sense in worrying about the things you can't control, do what I can. And, um, tr if I think something's the best at the time in my heart and go with it, it might not turn out right, but at least if I, if I keep playing that hand long enough, things ought to be okay. You know, I can't control how it's going to turn out, but if I just kind of follow my own moral compass enough times, uh, hopefully, you know, you'll, things will turn out okay in the end. And, and I think Absolutely. it's worked out pretty well. You know, there's, whenever there's a difficult situation, you kind of got to ask yourself those questions like, what can I do about this? How, what responsibility can I take? And, um, yeah, and I found there's a lot of freedom in that. Um, w when you decide that you have control over something, then you can do something about it. If you decide, if you would have decided, like, I guess I can't do this because the studio is not going to hire me anymore, then you just put yourself as a victim. Then people would probably understand, you know, oh man, sorry to hear that. You took a big risk, but hey, come on home. It's okay. 
Uh, but you decided not to do that. You said, well, what can I do with this? And here you are on the music yeah, production I'm... podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what was, was, everything is leading towards. This is it. <laughs> no, it's really a cool thing. And, and um, it, I think that can be really helpful for people. Because if you're going to do music, you're going to find yourself in those situations. The rejection or just the lack of results is part of it, no matter what, mm-hmm. no matter how you look at it. And you know, you're know, you lucky to get any success even when you do any, everything right. So it's it's a really important thing to keep in mind and just be aware of. Like you are going to come across these things that are going to seem like impossible obstacles. You know, what are you going to do in those situations? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that it becomes easier to find what the answer is to do if you do a lot of thinking about what you're the most passionate about and why you're so passionate about that. Mm. You know, what is it that you want to spend the time that you have alive? you know, doing, uh, and why is it that you are drawn towards doing that, finding that, that, uh, intention that's, that's bigger than yourself and your own, uh, you know, goals and things, but what is it that really pushes you to do that? And for me, discovering that, and the reason that I started thinking about discovering that was when I couldn't get a job anywhere, I started reading a lot of books about how to get a job. Hmm. And, uh, the one thing that continued to come up was, you know, having a mission um, for yourself, and then really understanding the purpose, you know, b- behind the why that you're, you know, that you're going after this thing. So I did a lot of soul searching and thinking and uh, on that. And when I was able to discover what it meant for me, it became this powerful tool that I used anytime I got hit with adversity. And if you're in the entertainment industry, you're gonna just have to get used to being in moments of adversity because it happens, uh, you know, nonstop. Doesn't matter. How long your career's been, and you know where it goes. There's always those things that are, you know, that roller coaster ride um, that's happened. Keeps things interesting, but it also sure. keeps it really challenging. And I've found that by having that clarity, I've been able to stay really grounded, for the most part, uh, in those moments that are really cha- that that uh, are really challenging to to get through. Hmm. I like that you bring up not only finding the passion but the why as well. I find that's a really interesting question to ask myself a lot. And I've brought it up to like my students too, and whether it's music or in in high school, um, you know, like something upsets you, right? Like, um, why did that upset you? What is it about it? You know, well, he punched me. You know, that I'm mad because he punched me. Well, why? You know, well, when you really dig into it, it it, it gets into like this like uh, self respect thing, like. Um, well, I feel like he doesn't respect me. He doesn't see me for who I am, and he's he's putting me down. And and you you can really get a lot of answers and clarity through that question of why. You know, why is it that I like making music? Why is it that I this is uh, meaningful to me? And you can find that meaning too in a lot of other things as well. You can start applying that in other aspects of your life. Absolutely. The, the why that I discovered uh, was in a book that I was reading for, as a quote by a philosopher named William James. And he said, the best use of life is to use it for something that outlasts it. Mm-hmm. And when I first that read that, yeah. it like immediately uh, hit something, like struck a chord with me that I didn't really understand at first. So I had to do some like contemplation, but there hmm. was just something that just made me feel content uh, through reading that, and what I've, what I came to learn was that the idea was that I could create this purpose behind. I knew that I wanted to work with artists and create music, and that's that was what my career was going to be. But the why behind it was to be able to have the opportunity to create something that could outlive me, that would uh, uh, allow me to um, have an impact on the world, you know, in a way that was. Uh, driven by my passion for what I loved doing the most, um, but could also have a significant impact that was, you know, that was bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've always had a little bit of a um, challenging relationship with the thought of our like mortality and stuff. And so from my own um, just like 
outside, as you mentioned, like outside, you find things outside of your, you know, just your, like your career. So my own just sort of like fears about, you know, like life and stuff and the unknown, um, I was able to use this understanding to be able to see that there were opportunities for me to be able to uh, live beyond my, you know, human existence, I guess, you know, in, in, in that way, in a way that would be able to leave something here, you know, for, uh, for others. And that made me feel more comfortable in that, um, in, in, in that idea. Uh, so there was, there's just so much power in that statement. And then it became part of the mission statement for my business. And it's on the bottom of every email that I send uh, because it is just the thing that has really grounded me. And uh, so I think that I wanted to share that as an example, I guess, because sometimes people will hear you say that and they're like, well, yeah, but what, is, what does that mean? Like your why, like you want to be famous or you want to like make a lot of money or have a hit record or win a Grammy or, you know, that sort of thing. Those are like really strong goals to have um, and, and things that you should definitely have written down um, and things that you should read every day uh, and, and commit to yourself. But the, the why is this thing that can drive you emotionally in a, in a, in a way that's bigger uh, than yourself. And when I discovered that for me, it just really helped me stay grounded as much as is physically possible within the challenging world of the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great quote. Yeah. And I do remember you bringing that up the last time we spoke and stuck with me hearing it too. Just, uh, it's powerful, you know, that, cause that is something that's one way we can live on you know, beyond whatever we are lucky enough to get. If we have that impact, I think when I started teaching, I, I was kind of lucky that I didn't realize this at the time, but uh, it took maybe like, I don't know, a year or two, three maybe, when a student would, came back and said something about the class that they liked or that affected them. And it just occurred to me like, wow, you know, that was just something I just kind of, it wasn't in my lesson plan. You know, it was just some, maybe some life story I threw in that just popped in my head to help get the point across. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with this kid for a while and they're telling me about it now. And it just, you know, that whole thing, you throw a stone in the water and it ripples out real far. It just really occurred to me how much that happens every day. We really just almost never get to see that. That's that's something with teaching. You don't get to see your job well done like almost ever. <laughs> you get once in a while someone says something like that to you and you got to really like hold on to that. But mm -hmm. you know the bell rings or the class ends every day and you know no one looks smarter. <laughs> no one has <is> suddenly <laughs> figured out life. No one's music is 100,000 times better after that one session. But it, it does matter. You don't always get to know. You don't always get to hear why. And, and it's true in my life too. And I think to some of my teachers, some of them that had a big impact have no idea that that little thing they said made a difference. But we are always putting those ripples out into that pond. So it's it's important to you, you pay attention to how you're <laughs> rippling the water. Absolutely. <laughs> Having that that mission statement, I think, is is a great idea. Really important, you know. That's a, a good like kind of a north star to follow. Yeah, it's been very helpful for me mm. uh, in, in so many ways. And as you mentioned, outside of just business, it, it just helps with life too, and you know, in general, to start to discover these things. And uh, the more experienced or older that I get. Uh, the more I recognize how important having those types of philosophies are to be able to have a really um, fulfilling life, you know. Hmm. Probably wouldn't be a bad <laughs> few classes to take in school about those sorts of things, you know, just just to understand. Because it, it struck me probably a little bit later than, you know, schooling age, even after college where it really kind of hits you. Um, mm -hmm. but it matters quite a lot. Yeah. So you're doing a lot of, um, and now there's a lot more like video work in what you do. Um, how's the future looking for you guys? Are you excited about anything coming up or um, looking forward to something? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I'm just looking forward to being able to keep doing what I love every day. 
Mm. And that, that's the first thing. And, and simplifying that priority for me really helps me stay grounded with things uh, because I have a lot of, you know, grand ideas of, uh, of things to, you know, to grow into. Um, hopefully the next time that we chat, we'll be able to talk in more detail about this new platform that we're developing on the educational um, side mm. of things. Uh, so that is one thing that, you know, folks in a, uh, a lot on. Um, and can continuing to, to grow the artist development side of, you know, of what we do. We have some really great artists that are um, launching um, an initial like debut projects and, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, I think the, the constant focus isn't really on like one singular sort of uh, project or, or like activity, but just on the idea of how to continue to be creative in the way that we can expand the philosophy behind our business model of just serving the artist vision in any way that we can valuably, you know, do that. And the more that the way that music is consumed uh, adjusts and evolves, um, the more fun it gets for me to experiment and brainstorm, I guess, on how I could come up with new creative ways to be able to mm. support artists in that way. So you see the inevitable changes and constant evolution of music as opportunity. That sounds absolutely. Like, I mean, yeah. what else? What else can it be? <laughs> I, I get, well, it comes back to what you choose things to be. You know, mm -hmm. I could choose to be upset about how things change, um, and I could choose to argue against uh, why things would be. You know, would be different. Or I can just be open to the way that things are evolving and then think creatively about how to get ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And I have found over my somewhat long career at this point that just trying to get ahead of, of, of the curve and paying attention to the way things are changing instead of enrolling with that current as opposed to fighting against it has always led me to a, a better place and a more successful place than maybe others that I've seen around me that would ju that would just kind of fight against, you know, the change and just sit around arguing about, you know, the good old days. Right. Um, <laughs> let's just make today the, the, the good old day and yeah. we're going to come up with a creative way to be able to do what we love and serve people's vision in the, you know, the process. Sure, because 10 years from now, these will be the good old days. We'll be looking back and like, remember those times? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any particular um, new things happening in music that you're excited about or looking forward to uh, the challenge of? Um, I'm really interested in the immersive audio um, mm. technology and the ways in which it will be, it will adjust the way that we experience could potentially adjust the way that we experience music, um, but I'm more I'm I'm just interested, sort of from like an outside looking in and trying to. That's one of the things that I've been brainstorming a lot about is trying to think about how I could partake in the, you know, in the, in the growth of that that sort of thing. And we, we kind of I kind of explored like the Dolby Atmos mixing like thing a little bit, um, just to kind of understand what that market you know might look like. And there's definitely a lot of changes that are happening uh, or uh, a lot of opportunity, I guess, that's happening within that side of things. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see how that, that develops. There's just been so many of those things that have been these new, like uh, hi-fi or like prosumer type uh, technologies that people get really hyped on in the industry, but then just don't really like land in the long term of the just average yeah. music fan. You know, right. so I'm I'm really interested to see if if this is, becomes, you know, one of those things that does land with the average music fan and changes the way that music is experienced, or if it's just sort of another high tech, uh, you know, excitement, you know, kind of factor deal. But that really intrigues me, and I think that if I was just getting started in the industry today, I would I would definitely be exploring even further. Um, you know, into that. If I was, if I was thinking, you know, how do I, how do I um, launch a new, you know, uh, business or find a place in a in a in a um, industry that's very saturated, you know, trying to think about some of these new waves that are, you know, that are happening, right? With stuff, um, the the whole um, like NFT 
market with thing with things uh, seems interesting to me. Not something that we've really like dove into yet, but it's been intriguing to see the difference of opinions and the different uh, circles, I guess, of you know folks and stuff that are gravitating towards that sort of thing. And it seems like it's become something that's a part of all types of different entertainment now. I just got tickets for a comedy show that's happening later this year, and um, it was just part of the ticket. It was like you get like an NFT thing, and hmm. um, I'm not even really sure what that's going to equate to, but uh, it was <laughs> yeah. uh, it was interesting. It's, it's kind of yeah. kind of you know seeing it everywhere. Kind of a new way of promoting things and getting people involved. It's interesting. Um, I don't understand it very well, the NFT side of stuff, anyway. But um, yeah, people are talking about it, and <laughs> they're heated on either side. It seems the Dolby Atmos thing is is interesting because, like you said, there's been so many things that kind of pop up and then kind of fade away. It's going to be the new thing: get a laser disc player, and you know whatever, and it's gone. But um, it does have a the Apple backing, you know, and that it's pretty common on a lot of the things I see that I stream. Um, it's interesting. It is. And it, it, it doesn't require much in the way of equipment. You know, you can do it right. And these uh, AirPods I'm wearing are compatible with it. Mm -hmm. um, I've listened to um, a bunch of albums I'm familiar with that were then converted to Atmos and mixed feelings. You know, there's some things I've heard where I thought like the mix got all messed up and things were too distant or too far away. Uh, but then there's other things where I was like, wow, I'm like, really, I think What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, that, that album sounded really cool. It sounded mm -hmm. very surrounded. But there were some other things where I felt like, you know, that it, it didn't help it. You know, it didn't make it better. So that, yeah, it's an interesting world, that stuff. And I guess if we start going into more and more VR, as it seems like they want us to, uh, it's going to matter more to be you know, to feel immersed in your music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who knows what that world's going to look like, though. <laughs> yeah, maybe next time we'll do a podcast, we'll be in, um, you know, a different world yeah. or environment. Yeah, we'll have, like, purple dinosaurs in the background hanging out with us. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be cool. Well, I thank you for taking the time to talk again. Uh, it's great to hear your perspective, and um, I think your philosophy, having that, like, kind of guiding vision is something a lot of people can take away from and really apply to their own lives and lives in general, but especially, you know, in your work and your music, because it can clarify things. I've, I've found myself kind of floundering in various projects where I realized like, why well, I'm, I shouldn't have done this. You know, it's, it was cool. I'm flattered that somebody wanted me to do this work, but you, you kind of know, like, I know when it's not, in line with my own personal beliefs and visions when I don't feel like doing it and I, I start avoiding it, you know, mm -hmm. so I think it's important to keep that stuff in mind. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Cool. So we can send people to the record shop, Nashville.com to kind of get into your world a bit. Uh, any place else you'd like to send people, any socials or anything like that? Um, yeah, we're probably the most active on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know all the all the platforms were there hanging right um, if anybody's looking for any advice or direction in their career a big part of the reason that I take time to do these uh, types of you know podcast discussions and stuff is because I feel very blessed to be in a position where I moved to a town and couldn't get a job and now I'm very fortunate enough to be able to own a business and do what I love every day and so I want to make it a mission to be able to give people whatever insight I can give through the experiences that I've had to help them have the same uh, privilege and blessing that in their lives that I've been able to have in my own. So if anyone's looking for any direction or advice, there's no strings attached. You can e email at the website and the message will get to me. You can hit us up on social media, ask a question, we'll get back to you. And uh, I'm, I'm just here to, here to help and, and guide people and hopefully give people the support and direction and mentorship that um, I wasn't able to discover for myself, you know, mm. uh, early on. 
in in my life and just kind of you know pay it forward in gratitude of what i what i get to do every day Hmm. that's cool man because you're climbing a steep mountain and it's nice that you're willing to put some energy into lending a hand to help some other people up too so thank you for what you're doing it's very cool absolutely all right and thank you everyone for listening we hope you guys have a great day